Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian. We are glad that you are here and gathered with us, whether you're here in person or at home. Welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made, and so let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the second Sunday in November. This is the Sunday before Veterans Day, and so we remember our veterans as we think towards the coming uh, holiday moment, and we'll remember, of course, our veterans in our prayers as well today. We are also uh, moving into the season of generosity, a time where we consider what it is that the Lord has called upon us to think about and share within the context of this congregation as we are already are projecting into the new year. It, It doesn't feel like we should be so close to the new year, but we are. We are getting very close to November, and we are getting very, uh, we are in November, we're getting very close to the new year uh, here in November, and so the leadership of the church is working and planning um, with budgets and and, uh, hopes and and um, promises of mission and ministry. And so then we are also turning to you, the members of this congregation, those who are a part of this congregation, and asking you to also consider how God is calling you to share and invest in the life and the ministry of First Presbyterian Church as we move into this new year. Because many of us are together, but many of us are at home, we have uh, provided a few different ways that you might uh, share your pledge and your gift uh, uh, for us, knowing what we will be um, uh, what you'll be sharing with us in the new year. The, the normal pledge cards uh, were sent out. I hope most of you uh, received that over last week. Those are, uh, we're, we're planning to take the final reception of those in a two more weeks on the 22nd. But if you bring them early, we will not turn them away. Uh, and if you are just a little bit late, that's all right. But the, the sooner you get that to us as close to that 22nd, the easier it will be for us in finalizing our plans financially for 2021. But you can also go online. There is a link in the emails that you get that you can use, or you can just go to our website directly under giving, uh, and you'll be able to find a online version that you can simply fill out and submit, and that will send your information directly to us. So you can do it in one of two ways, either fill this information out on the paper copy and send it back to the church either in person or in the mail, or you can go online and submit that information to us in that way. We thank you for the generosity that you have had over the years and that we know that you continue to invest in the life of this church as we move forward. Not only do we ask, of course, about how we move forward with our finances, but also how we move forward in our leadership. And so there are two special uh, uh, sets of leaders that we have within the Presbyterian Church, elders and deacons. Elders serve on our session and help us think about the vision and living out the ministry and mission that we have as a church. And deacons then become the, ha- the heart and hands of the congregation that reach out to members and take care of us as we are in need, as well as help us in our worship together, making sure that we are ready every Sunday to gather both where we are and out in the world. There is nomination forms that are also now available. You'll be receiving a, a paper copy of this in the mail this coming week. But you can also go online to where it says getting involved on our website and you'll be able to find a way to fill out that information uh, digitally as well. Whether you fill out that information about who you think might be a good candidate to help lead into the new years, the coming years, as you fill out that information, um, be mindful and thoughtful about your neighbor, your friends, your family, yourself, and about what God might be calling upon them or you as we move move forward in faith and in hope. This also is uh, the the Sunday before we have our our November uh, Holy Grounds event, our third Holy Grounds out of four. Um, Holy Grounds this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock will be geared around an open mic time where we'll have hot, ch- hot drinks, coffee, maybe some hot chocolate for some young folks, but some coffee for the rest of us, and a time to tell some stories. 
to share a story in your own life, to share and listen to stories of other people's lives, about their childhood or their parents or about something significant within their own life. Now, I will tell you that many of you will probably say, I don't have any stories. You all have stories. You all have a story to share, and if you want some help in the process, I'm happy to help you bring that story out next Saturday as well as we think about that together. If you're worried about standing alone, I can stand with you in a conversation as opposed to just a story. I have a great story I want to share with you, and I'm looking forward to those that gather 2 o'clock next Saturday uh, out here on the grounds uh, on this side of the building. Our food ministry continues to be uh, offered on, uh, between 11 and noon on Mondays in the uh, north parking lot drop-off area. We share that food with our partners in the Avondale United Methodist Church area, um, and we are thankful for those who are able and willing to share, whether it's a casserole or other food pantry items each week. It is making an important difference in the lives of many session uh the, speaking of leadership our session and uh, monthly meeting is tomorrow night so uh if you are on session that's just a reminder and if you are not just be in mind of prayer as the session does meet and considers continues to consider the the ways that god is calling us to live into our mission and our ministry in this time and into the future let us prepare now our hearts and our minds as we worship god Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with thousands, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. People of God, worship the living God today. Remember that of nothing God created the heavens and earth. Remember that God raised Jesus from the death to life and seated him at the right hand of the Father. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to God. Lord, you gave me arms that I might reach out to those who suffer, but too often I keep them wrapped around myself. You gave me feet that I might take the first step toward those who feel alone, afraid, oppressed, but too often I stay planted where I am most comfortable. Knowing your work in their lives or the way they've been denied justice, but too often I fail to listen. Lord, you gave me a mind that I might understand the brokenness of the world and be inspired to imagine a new way to live. But too often I am distracted, disinterested, disengaged. You gave me a mouth and I might tell your truth to the world. Then I might speak for justice where voices have been silenced. But too often I use my words to harm and not to build, or I remain silent, afraid of being judged. Lord, have mercy on me. Let us lift our silent confession to the Lord. Amen. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be made clean. I will cleanse you from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart for love alone. 
Hear the good news. In Christ we are forgiven. Live into your forgiveness and be at peace. generosity and our focus given to us by our generosity team is from Micah 6 8 those last words we said in our call to worship what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God since that is where we are aiming and thinking about our own calling as a congregation each week we will have an opportunity to think about from leaders of this church how we are already participating and also being called to continue our participation in each of these threefold calls. And so today we'll hear from, from one of our leaders, Jan McCune, and how we think about doing justice. More than ever, we are bombarded with stories and images of the pandemic, climate change, calls for justice reform, and much more. How can we possibly do justice as the prophet Micah tells us God requires of us? I picture the word justice, billboard size, all in capital letters, followed by exclamation points. My reaction is to get overwhelmed and think that's impossible, there's nothing that I can do. But if I write the word justice, notebook size, in small letters, I can wrap my head around it and see possibilities for action. I think of our recently completed Southview grant as doing justice with a small j. We targeted a small, manageable group, the teachers and staff at Southview, because they have the most impact on students and parents. We use grant funds to do projects that the teachers chose, such as redoing their lounge and workroom. And even though we cannot help in person this year, our volunteers are still making teaching materials, sewing masks, and preparing holiday food baskets. Members contributed money for student backpacks, and recently for funeral expenses for the two students who died in a car accident. Though we started small, our actions have produced a ripple effect. For example, United Way asked us to, to collaborate on a pilot virtual reading program called Muncie Reads. Another ripple is our collaboration with Avondale Methodist Church. Located in the 812 neighborhood, which is also the attendance area for Southview and the focus of Habitat's efforts in Muncie. Our members contribute homemade casseroles and food pantry items so the church can support its neighbors with their weekly meal and food giveaway. First Pres tries to give at least 10% of its budget to support mission, so our missional outreach committee is targeting the same neighborhood with grants. Avondale Church received a grant to open a bike repair shop slash ministry for neighborhood kids. And College Mentors for Kids received funding to expand their program to include Southview. We are also continuing our support for other nonprofits who serve the 812 neighborhood. We at First Pres do not have to solve all the world's problems. 
As Mother Teresa said, we cannot all do great things, but we can do small things with great love. We are fortunate enough to live in a small town where we can work together on local problems and actually see the impact that we are having. We can do justice with a small j. If many other congregations and towns do the same, one day we may see justice in bold, billboard-sized capital letters realized in our world. Thank you. So it is a wonderful opportunity, as I have mentioned, that we continue to reach out to young people who, who participate in our services wherever they may be, at whatever time they get to participate. As we think into this moment and think about Micah 6, 8, one of, those, one of those verses that I think many of us have learned and kept memorized. I know, I know people who wear just the words Micah 6, 8 and a necklace or have other items that remind them whether it's something they keep on their desk or on their table, just of these words that, Jesus, that, that the prophet Micah was given by God. What does the Lord require of you but to seek justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God? As we think about, as we think about doing justice, I recognize that first and foremost, these are action words. These are things that we can't just think about, we can't just consider. These are calls to do something with our life, our time, individually and communally. And so as we think about that with children, with you at home, how might you do justice? Maybe the first thing is to think about what doing justice looks like at a at a small j level, as, as Jan shared with us just now, is doing what's right. Not just for yourself, not just for your own life, but doing what's right for someone else. Doing what's necessary that they might have the basic love and dignity and needs taken care of. It's seeing beyond your own self. And seeing then that we are part of a collective, we are part of a world that is intertwined. And as we find ourselves taken care of by our parents, by our church family, by our t teachers and our friends, we also then recognize we can take care of each other. Take care of the new person who comes into your classroom or your preschool. Take care of the person who moves into your neighborhood and doesn't know anyone yet. Take care of the one who is left out or sits alone or isn't invited into the Foursquare or the Gaga Pit or whatever games that others are playing. Doing justice simply begins by taking care of one another, especially those who are on the edge, on the sides. So may we in our young selves find a way to do that and in our older selves find ways to do justice for one another, especially for those, those who are not just like you or I, for those who seem might, may be different. May we find our commonality in justice and love. Let us pray. Loving God, you come to us in others. Others who we laugh and play games with and others that are different and we have to learn about and who have to learn about us. May we be open to you and may we be open to your call for justice for each of us so that we might have the basic needs of dignity, of life, of grace and forgiveness, of love. In Christ's name we lift our prayers. Amen.
Please stand as you are able as we share peace with one another from where we are. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. There isn't a time where prayer is not important. But there are moments in our lives together that prayer seems to take a higher location. And so we once more gather as a people who are united and yet diversified in thought and in place. We're united, though, in prayer to a God who continues to listen, to call, and to move among us. And so let us come to that God now in prayer. God of all nations, parent of the human family, we give you thanks for the freedom that we exercise and the many blessings of democracy we enjoy in the United States. We ask for your protection and your guidance for all who devote themselves to the common good, working for justice and peace at home and around the world. Lord, after this week as we have seen elections at every level, we lift up all of those who are duly elected, and public servants, and we pray for our neighbors. We ask that you continue to work in healing the divisions that are in our midst and center each of us on the common purpose, the dedication, and the commitment that you give for us to live and to work for justice and kindness and to walk humbly with you. On this Sunday before Veterans Day, let us remember those who have served in our military. Lord, those men and women that have chosen to lift a life of duty and honor in their uniforms, some of which still carry the scars of war and violence, help us to not only honor them in our words of gratitude, but also in our care and our pursuit of peace. Lord, we pray, we pray for our mission partners, for those families and individuals who walk with us and in whom we walk with them, and in, in our time together, teach us to see your loving grace in the eyes of someone different. Help us to hear your good news of life and love and forgiveness in languages that speak to our hearts and to our minds as the pandemic continues to march forward O oh lord we lift up prayers for our community prayers for the people of this world and we especially pray for the doctors and the nurses and technicians who are on the front lines as the cases surge within our own midst Remind us that what we choose to do affects the lives of others. O oh Lord, remind us that you call us to love our neighbor. So give us the fortitude to follow through with those necessary mitigations that help reduce the spread of this pandemic. Ever-present God, you called us to be in relationships with one another, and you promise to dwell wherever two or three are gathered. So in our community, we are many different people. 
We come from many different places. We have many different cultures. Open our hearts that we may be bold to find the riches of inclusion and the treasures of diversity among us. We pray in faith. And whenever, O Lord, we find ourselves lost for the words that help us to understand the moment, may we always remember the prayer that you have taught all of your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stewardship season is one of those times that we get to that always feels a little odd and out of place. It feels like a weird moment where we have to think about how do I ask all of these good people to give a little more? But of course things are shifting and theology has been really catching up with us and reminding us that that isn't what generosity and stewardship is really about. At the end of the day, truly, this is a time that we remind ourselves about who we are called to be as a church, who God is calling us to be, and in that we remind ourselves and refocus ourselves in what we will invest our time, our energy, and our lives into as we move forward, as we aim and look for those times and ways that we can live into that vision that God gives us. And so our generosity team this year focused in on Micah 6.8 as we have shared, this threefold calling that the prophet gives to those who would be the chosen of Israel and through them those of us that continue to follow God through Christ. The vision of Micah 6.8 is a vision for the church, a vision that should be always in our midst, reminding us of what God does require of us, a calling that is worthy of our time, of our investments, of our commitment. And so this week we begin with the first of the three callings that the prophet gives us, to do justice. And as I was wrestling with what we might think about in this doing of justice, there were two texts that I felt came together and informed us a little bit more about what this doing justice might look like as we, uh, as First Presbyterian, move forward into this new year. These two work together. Sometimes they feel like they push on each other, but I would like to put forth as we listen to these two passages how they actually work together. The first is from Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. This is the words that come at the end of the story of the Tower of Babel. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Then taking from that moment to the story of Pentecost that happens in Acts chapter 2, we'll just read the first four verses. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the, run, the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Lord, we ask that your spirit once more enter into our time and enter through your word that it might open us to justice, to justice within our lives, within our community, within our world. And so open us again to your word this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Maybe you're like me, and the story of the Tower of Babel was one of those wonderful stories that you learned in childhood. You maybe had the image of that tower that was reaching up into the heavens that was half built, that was then left off at the end of the story, unfinished. And the the story, as it was told more often in, the, in my childhood, was that the story that, that God was unhappy with the people because of this great tower and this hubris that they thought they could reach heaven, they could reach God in their own work. And so they're punished. They're scattered from this unified city and diversified by their languages so they are confounded and confused and unable to communicate with one another. This great diversity that then causes division and violence to one another and tribalism. That was the story, well, maybe not quite in those same words, but that's the story that ta the Tower of Babel often came across as from childhood on. And then sometimes, maybe in study or maybe in sermon, the, the story of Pentecost has been laid out as some undoing, as some reunification that undoes the punishment of Babel and brings God's purpose finally back together in this story of the Holy Spirit that gives this power of language so that each hears in their own in their own native first language but there's the, some challenges that I've been contemplating as I've come to these texts this week and thought about them as they maybe help us think about justice within our world these these are not juxtaposed juxtaposed stories that work against each other or work to undo one from the other if that was true, if Pentecost was a, a, a redemption of the Tower of Babel, then, then surely there would have been a single common language that was given instead of each speaking within the different languages. A, a common bringing together and suddenly where Jerusalem, this place where the Pentecost story unfolds, becomes the one city, the unified city that brings the whole world together. But that's not what happens. That is not the story that unfolds on Pentecost. And when reflecting back to the story of Babel, I wonder if even the story maybe has been shared without its full nuances, the full knowledge of what else is there. The, the story of, t of the tower comes in the 11th chapter of Genesis, but if we go back to that first chapter that creation story those six days and the seventh he rested we remember on the sixth day that God creates humanity and God then blesses them and God says to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth in Babel in the city and the tower there is this trying of us to come and become single and one-minded to become unified to the point that we don't need to follow the idea of multiplying and spreading beyond the earth and diversifying instead suddenly then God says my plan from the beginning of creation was that you would fill the earth 
not just one city, not just one place, not just one peoples. Maybe Babel was more about what God was seeking to fulfill from the beginning, moving people out of their own comfort, moving them into a world that calls them to have to adapt, to shift and change, to diversify, and then to be prosperous because of it. Maybe the story of Babel is actually part of God's good gift in creation. I've been blessed. One of my favorite things that I was taught from my childhood and has extended into my life that helped call me into the ministry has been the opportunities I've had to serve in mission. I've served in mission in my hometown of Jefferson City and along the Gulf Coast of our own country after hurricanes. I've served in Peru and in parts of Africa. It has been a blessing to reach beyond my own normal places of comfort. But I'll have to be really honest, as a child, my understanding of mission work began with the idea that I had something that someone else didn't have, and I needed to give it to them. Maybe it was that I had more money, or maybe it was that I had more time or knowledge about something, or maybe it was that I had more faith. So I needed to go to those places that were underserved, that seemed to be lacking in some of these items. I would have to go and bring with me all my wealth and all my gifts so that I could build a house for someone, so that I could give food to someone, so that I could see the foreign country but bring my American Midwest values with me. And then I spent a a few weeks in Pisco, Peru. It was a mission trip that I had when I was a teenager. I went with my father and some other members of the church that I grew up with, and we were called and invited to come and build houses, to help build houses on the western side of the country. That is the side next to the ocean. That was sea level area, sandy area. And so we got to our work site, and there with our local guides and helpers, we were invited to help build a home, a house. And so we waited. Where was the cement trucks, and where was the foundations going to be built and put together, and where was the, where was the, the framework and the wood that we would need to create the walls and the, the trusses that would create the roof? But what was brought was rocks and gravel and large stones, a small cement mixer, and shovels. And so we worked alongside of each other, digging with our hands, pouring in the the sand and the cement and the rocks into the small mixer. We watched as an artisan took that same mortar and created the stones that would build up the walls there just a few yards from our construction site on the desert floor. We had to learn to work together. We, we didn't know the ways of how they were going to do all this construction. We, we had a different way of doing it at home in the habitat builds I'd already been a part of. This was totally different, but the challenge was I didn't know Spanish. I still don't know very much. And the people we worked with, well, they didn't know English very well either. But we worked together as we laid these large, giant stones down within the pits that we dug that would become the foundation of this house. We would, they would ask for certain sizes of stones, and we, I knew Grande, I, I've heard the Taco Bell <laughs> different uh, car commercials, I knew what large was, but pecania is one of those words I had to learn about small, and then picking up and looking and saying, how about this one? And I learned, masu menus, more or less, that's good enough. 
We had to learn a lot about good enough. Masu menus. And so we worked together and we put together the foundation and the rebar that made the edges and then the blocks to make the walls. There were moments where those among us who were more knowledgeable than I was as a teenager were questioning, usually mostly in English, wouldn't this be so much easier if only we could do it the way we did it at home? But the stones and the rebar and the concrete blocks that were formed on the desert floor, all of this was what they knew how not only to do, but to keep, to maintain. This is the language that they speak. This is the language that we had to learn from them as we worked together. As I thought about the story of Pentecost, as I thought about this story of the Holy Spirit that allowed the disciples to come out of their home, out of their their closed-in space, and to finally, as the birth of the church, as this first act of being the church, is to tell good news in another language, in someone else's language, I had to start wondering, is good news even good if it can't be understood? If it can't be felt by someone else. The Holy Spirit allows them to speak in another language more than, more than allows, but calls them, calls them to do so, compels them to speak so that they can be heard in the first language of those pilgrims who were around them in Jerusalem in that time. That's how the church begins. With good news being spoken so that others can hear it. They can feel it. They can know it. By sharing the message of Christ's life and Christ's death and resurrection in a voice that could be understood by all. I've been blessed over the years to have many classes that have taught me foreign languages, though I will be the first to say because of lack of use, most of that information is in a notebook somewhere. In, co- in high school, I had four years of German. In seminary, I had intensive classes on Greek and Hebrew, but there is no such thing as a direct translation. That's one of the learnings when you learn another language. There is no easy way to say this word means exactly that word. All you have to do is switch them and the common knowledge is based. Instead, we know that translation is something that gets us close. It gives us something that means similar But there's nuances, there's cultural nuances, there's historic nuances, there's linguistic nuances that each give a slightly different understanding when we change languages. No one language, though, can hold the good news. In the Pentecost story, we quickly realize that that Arabic or Hebrew or Greek or Latin or English, none of it is the whole soul holder of good news. Good news must be good without the need to translate, but by, by the reception of it in our own native tongue for each of us. First Presbyterian has begun already, as every church should have a history that can be pointed to, speaking good news in different languages. We've already been called beyond ourselves and beyond those who, who simply easily fit into the norms and the history that is already a part of our congregation. We have been called to begin to learn new languages, and many among us have. Some have learned Korean, 
and have gathered with the international congregation that is a vital part of the life and the ministry of this church. Some have learned Spanish so that we can be gained in, uh, continued in our ministry that is connecting us to the Dominican Republic. But many of us have also had to learn the languages of poverty, the languages of grief, the languages of immigration, the languages of the hungry, the language of the prisoner. We have to learn new languages because good news can only really be good if it is felt by someone else, not just our own, not just ourselves. Justice is when good news is able to be heard. Justice is when good news is a a partnership in diversity and relationships. Partners in the good news, as was shared already about our connection to elementary students in Southview and their families on on the near south side, Mission partners in the DR and college students in our neighbors at Ball State and the other universities around us. This church has already begun learning new languages. But as we go forward, we know that God continues to call us to invest in this work, to double down on our calling to share good news and to hear good news in new languages, in new lives, in new relationships. Do justice by seeing each other, by learning from one another and finding in our midst, finding Christ, finding Christ's good news, alive and well to be heard and shared. That is worthy of investing our lives, our time, our talents. That is worthy of being the church here in this time and place. We are called to do justice. And so may we learn the language of love spoken to each person. The language that is God's good news in his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
if we are able to take Micah 6.8 seriously as a congregation, if we're able to commit to the purpose within the threefold calling of the prophet to the people, then we become bearers of good news. We become bearers of good news in many different languages, with many different circumstances and location. God's vision is one worthy of our time and our energy. It's worthy of our resources and our gifts. God calls us to give with a cheerful heart, and so so we who are uh, presenting our tithes and offerings this day are called to joyfully give with hope in the promise that has been given to us. Those who are gathered this morning are welcome to leave an offering as you depart at the, off, at the recessional offering plates. Those who are at home are welcome to share through the mail or online through our giving portal. But now we remember that we give because of the generosity of our Lord who has loved us in every language. Thanks be to God.
That song, the Everyone Born, A Place at the Table, is one of the newer songs that is within our, newer hymn, our new hymnal, a beautiful song that reminds us just about that justice and joy that we are called and to as the body of Christ. It's never too late to learn a new language. It takes time, it takes work, it takes effort, but it is worth it because the new language that we learn connects us and brings us together and so that we can care for one another and what happens to each other. Justice is knowing that we are called to love even across the boundaries of language, of class, of culture, we're called to love. So may we learn the language of Christ's love for us and speak good news so that others might hear. As we go into this world, may that language that we have heard, you are beloved. May that be the language that we're able to share. With the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit, may those blessings rest and remain upon you and those you love and those who no one loves, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen. Mm -hmm.